Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Ted McGinn. I'm with Lavelle Law, and this is Breakfast Briefs. Today we have a panelist uh, with us, and we're going to be addressing uh, issues in divorce, unpacking less common issues in divorce. So certainly we'll be dealing with some unique situations. Uh, but by all means, uh, you know, we're we'll also address some general uh, concepts and principles related to divorce. Um, so I want to introduce our panelists today. Uh, we have with us Emil Alcast. Emil has been uh, with Lavelle Law for many, many years, and he focuses his practice on family law, divorce, and you know, child custody issues. But in addition, Emil also handles immigration issues. Sometimes immigration and divorce intersect in, in unique ways. So it will be kind of tackling some of those issues. Uh, second, we have Joe Ozauka with us today. Joe has uh, been with us uh, for a shorter period of time, but he has many years of experience in the area of family law um, and issues of divorce, custody issues, and all the related issues that come up and intersect with divorce. And then finally, we have Patty Levinson. Patty also uh, works in the area of the divorce, but she also handles something a little bit more unique. It's known as a collaborative divorce, uh, something more uh, seen more often these days, which I, uh, so if Patty does have experience in that area, so she'll spend some time explaining what is a collaborative divorce and you know, why is it something you should consider. Before we really get into this, I wanna kind of deal with a few housekeeping matters. Uh, first of all, if you do have questions throughout the presentation, there is a chat platform there that you feel free to help uh, help yourself to that, send out a question, and, and throughout the presentation, if, you, if it occurs to you, go ahead and use that. I will present that question to our speaker and we'll do our best to tackle uh, those questions. And certainly at the very end, we, we, we would open up for additional questions. Uh, also, I just want to make it clear that, uh, you know, the purpose of this presentation today is educational only. We're not here to give anybody legal advice. Uh, you know, in order for us to provide legal advice, we do want to sit down with you in a private and confidential manner. Hear the uh, facts and circumstances related to your particular situation. Um, so today we're not providing that at all. Um, but uh, so this is just a presentation on an educational basis. Uh, Lavelle Law, we are a full service law firm. We uh, have offices in Chicago as well as Schaumburg. We have a number of different practice areas. Of course, family law is one of our busy areas. Um, but in addition to that, we have a bustling uh, commercial litigation practice. We have a business law group that handles uh, corporate compliance matters as well as mergers, acquisitions, business formations. We also have a very busy estate planning group that can handle the preparation of wills, trusts, uh, also handle probate matters, uh, very busy practice these days. Um, so real estate as well is another area that we do a lot of work in. So we have a, just a wide spectrum of different legal practice areas that we have attorneys that focus in those particular uh, areas. I would also say that we will always provide a free initial consultation to new clients. So if you have a legal issue, you want to uh, seek an opinion, uh, maybe some guidance, you're not really sure whether you need an attorney or not, uh, we would be happy to sit down with you. Uh, no charge for that initial consultation. Uh, by all means, feel free to reach out to any one of our panelists or myself after today's session if you do want to sit down with us on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, get this started. I'm going to turn this over to Joe. Uh, he's going to talk about the intersection of divorce and estate planning. Joe? Morning. Thank you, Ted. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone today. My area that I'm going to discuss today again is the intersection of divorce and estate planning. Uh, we all know that divorce and going through a divorce is a significant life-changing experience. You're dealing with issues of child custody. Uh, for, uh, parenting time, visitation, division of assets, and it can be a very difficult experience that can leave many scars. But after going through that process and completing all the tasks that are required of a judgment, including division of assets, you may get through the process and say, wow, now I can finally take a breath and start moving on with my life, but not so fast. Ted, could you go to the next, next stand, please? 
So in these type of situations, it's important to look at what happens with your assets as it relates to the conclusion of your divorce. Just because a judgment for dissolution of marriage is in your case does not mean that all the financial issues have been addressed and completed as it relates to transfer of your assets. So once we do the uh, entry of the judgment for dissolution of marriage, we look at what assets have been divided in your case. Specifically, I'm going to touch on a number of different assets that are very common in divorce cases that need to be addressed and should be looked at at the conclusion of your case or at the time of entry of your judgment. Your next slide, Ted. Specifically, I'm going to talk about a number of different interests and in retirement accounts that you should address as part of moving on with your life and addressing situations that might exist that need to be addressed concerning beneficiary designations specifically with IRAs. Now, in many cases, parties have in, uh, individual, individual retirement accounts uh, that, say, that they had as part of their marriage, during their marriage, and those assets are normally divided as part of a divorce case. But once the judgment for dissolution of marriage is entered in the case, sometimes provisions are not specifically contained in the divorce judgment that specifically indicate that a beneficiary change should take place on an IRA. So for example, you may have your wife listed as a beneficiary on your IRA uh, during your marriage. At the time of entry of the judgment for dissolution of marriage, you may or may not have taken the uh, steps necessary to remove that ex-spouse as a beneficiary of that account. So it's important to address that issue and make the change of a beneficiary designation on IRA upon completion of the divorce so that you don't run into circumstances or problems down the line regarding the transfer of that interest in the IRA in the event you were to pass. So it's not uncommon for the IRA owners to overlook changing that beneficiary. And if you fail to do so, it could result in the transfer of that IRA's interest to your former spouse even after your divorce. So it's critical to look at those IRAs and plans that you have for your retirement accounts to make sure that the beneficiary designations are modified and or changed to protect your best interest and to meet the requirements that you may have regarding transfer of that interest upon your death. So uh, with an IRA, it's rather simple. Changing a beneficiary in an IRA can take place at any time. It can take place during the marriage and after the marriage. But it is critical that you meet with uh, your plan advisor, if you have one, a state planning advisor, to discuss what is the proper way in which to change that beneficiary designation, and then perhaps appointing a new beneficiary as it relates to that interest in that account. A second area, which is somewhat different than an IRA or 401k. Now, a number of uh, people have 401k plans through their private employers, uh, which are provided uh, during their employment with their employers. Uh, these 401ks are slightly different than IRAs. They are subject to what is known as the Employer Retirement Income Security Act, or is ERISA, which is known as ERISA. Now, federal law controls the designation of beneficiaries in 401k plans of private employers. Unlike IRAs, during your marriage, you cannot change the beneficiary of your 401k from your spouse. ERISA requires your spouse to be named as a beneficiary of that 401k plan during your marriage. So, upon completion of your divorce, if you are awarded your 401k plan in that situation, uh, you need to address the change of beneficiary as it relates to that 401k plan. There have been cases, and it's not uncommon, where parties do not make that change of beneficiary designation on their 401k plan, which they have received as part of their divorce. And under ERISA, the requirements of federal law state that 401k plan administrators and trustees uh, in, to those plans must make payment to the beneficiaries that are listed on those 401k plans. So for example, in the event you get a divorce and you were awarded your 401k plan, in that situation, if you had your spouse formally named as the beneficiary and you did not make that change of that beneficiary designation, it could cause really serious legal problems going forward. So what happens if you don't change your beneficiary after the divorce from your former spouse or to another beneficiary. In Illinois, a case came up in 2018 that addressed this issue. It's called Herbert versus Cunningham. In that case, a decedent's ex-spouse sought to claim ownership of her former husband's 401k plan after his death. And in that situation, 
the 401k plan administrators and trustees of the plan went ahead and transferred the asset to the employee's estate and not to the ex-spouse. In that situation, the ex-spouse was still listed as the beneficiary of the 401k plan. And the reasoning behind the employer's determination that it should be transferred to the uh, decedent's or the employee's uh, estate was that he had a divorce agreement which provided that the 401k plan would pass to his estate and not to his wife. But the wife argued and went to court on this situation and stated that ERISA requires the plan administrator to pay her the benefit of the 401k because under federal law, he, she was still listed as the beneficiary of that account. So the court had to look at that issue and say, what is the best way to address this situation? Now, luckily for the employee, the deceased employee in this situation, the court found in his favor. But the reason the court did so is that their judgment for dissolution of marriage specifically stated that he would receive the 401k plan as his uh, asset as part of the divorce case. It also stated that each of the parties would relinquish or release their rights uh, to all property that they may have in the other's property. So the divorce agreement was basically controlling in the situation in the court's eyes because there was specific language as it related to transfer of that asset and also the relinquishment or waiver of the interest by the other spouse. Now, the, the issue that is most important for us to understand is that although this occurred and the court did save this situation from becoming a, a transfer to an ex-spouse, it cost a lot of money. It took a lot of time, a lot of litigation. So the parties ex expended quite a large sum of money to litigate this issue in the court system. So to avoid this situation, there's a couple of really important takeaways as it relates to your 401k plans and perhaps even pension plans that are awarded to you in your divorce case. First, any divorce agreement that you enter into with your divorce attorney should specifically, specifically and clearly state your intentions regarding the 401k account and who's awarded which portion and the relinquishment also waiving your interest or their interest in your plan. So it's critical when you work with your divorce attorney prior to the entry of the judgment that language is included in that agreement that specifically addresses these issues. If you do not address these issues and you fail to make those transfers uh, as it relates to the beneficiary designation upon completion of your divorce, you could run into some very serious situations regarding the transfer of that asset to a that ex-spouse, which is clearly not something that most people would like to have happen. Next, there are pension plans. In most cases in divorce situations, we have a division of pension plans that parties have uh, as part of their, their marital estate. Specifically, there are private pension plans and there are state pension plans. Now, once you enter your ju judgment for dissolution of marriage, that entry of the judgment does not in and of itself change the transfer of interest as it relates to a beneficiary of these pension plans. So these issues must also be addressed at the time of entry of the judgment or even after entry of the judgment for dissolution of marriage. Private retirement plans normally can be transferred by way of specific court orders. Now, in, in judgments for dissolutions of marriage, you may not have specific language as it relates to how to transfer that interest. So the courts have established and state laws have established uh, certain orders which can be entered in cases that address the transfer of interest. And specifically, as it relates to private uh, retirement accounts or pensions, documents called qualified domestic relations orders that are prepared specifically to provide for the transfer of retirement account benefits to a former spouse as, as a part of a divorce. Now these quadros is what they are called, QDROs, are basically orders that indicate to the plan administrators how to divide these assets. So these need to be prepared by a competent attorney and or retirement plan specialist to allow the transfer of the beneficial interest of, in a uh, retirement plan to a, to a spouse. And a lot of times these issues were overlooked. It is not uncommon in divorce cases if the appropriate agreements are not prepared in the case and the judgment is not properly prepared by the attorneys, that these quadros are never entered. So it's not uncommon for a number of years to pass where parties have been awarded a certain interest in their former spouse's uh, retirement plan, but they've taken no action to, to execute that. That's why it's critical for all parties involved in a divorce to address these issues during the divorce case or immediately thereafter 
to make sure that these issues are addressed regarding transfer of the interest. If you fail to do so, it can create all kinds of headaches and problems in the future. For example, it's not uncommon for par parties to wait a number of years to, to address this issue. With the passage of time, it's not uncommon for these issues to be litigated uh, frequently in the court system, requiring substantial legal fees, delay of benefits, and also a possibility of, of a, a, an, adverse re an adverse finding against you because you didn't take the action necessary to transfer your interest at the time of the, ju the judgment for dissolution of marriage. So this is a critical area. So what you need to remember is when you have a divorce case, you have a retirement plan, you need to be speaking with your attorney to make sure that it specifically addresses the issue of the transfer of your interest in your spouse's plan if it's awarded to you by way of a qualified domestic relations order or other order to make sure that transfer takes place. If it is not addressed in your judgment, it should be addressed quickly thereafter by your, your attorney or through your estate planning attorneys. Now, there are also private, or I should say public state pension plans. State of Illinois has pension plans. Teacher retirement systems have pension plans. They are addressed in a different way as it relates to a transfer of an interest in that asset to a former spouse. This is done through a qualified Illinois domestic relations order, or what's known as a quildro. These orders are similar to quadros, and they are used by the, the court system to identify and, and advise the uh, retirement plans what is the way these assets should be divided between the parties. Again, this issue should be addressed during the divorce process with your attorney. It's critical that you do so and that you include language in your settlement agreement or judgment that specifically addresses this issue. And these orders should be entered as soon as possible after entry of the judgment or at the time of the judgment so that these transfer of interest can take place and that there's not a passage of time. Ted, could you go to the next slide, please? You also need to address issues regarding beneficiary designations of other assets that you have uh, as a result of the divorce, specifically life insurance policies. It's very common for parties to maintain life insurance policies during their marriage, naming their spouse as beneficiaries. In a divorce situation, in most, in many cases, that situation can change upon the divorce and a, a new beneficiary might wanna be named by the, the party that retains ownership of that. Under former Illinois law, there was no uh, indication as to what happens if you don't change your beneficiary as it relates to a life insurance policy uh, naming your ex-spouse post-divorce. The law, the, the case law provided that the divorce itself would terminate that relationship and it would end the beneficiary's rights to receive your benefits under the life insurance policy. But in 2019, Illinois passed a new statute which basically automatically terminates that relationship as far as your beneficiary is concerned on your life insurance policy. It specifically provides it upon entry of the judgment for dissolution of marriage, that beneficiary designation is terminated and is no longer enforceable in the event you don't make the change on the policies. So it's a protection, but it's not a guarantee that it's gonna save you from heartache, litigation, and additional costs if you don't take the necessary steps to address those issues uh, in your judgment for dissolution of marriage and after entry of your judgment. So working hand in hand with your attorney in your divorce case and a good estate planning attorney or a group of uh, attorneys in that area is critical to address those issues regarding life insurance policies. So you wanna look at those and you wanna make sure that you make the appropriate change of designation of beneficiaries, be it yourself personally or to your children or to someone else and address those as soon as possible. Another area of concern is health insurance policies. In divorce cases, it's, done, it's normal practice that one of the parties or both parties are required to maintain health insurance for the benefit of their children. There are also best beneficiary designations as it relates to interest in those, those type of plans. But what happens if your spouse does not follow the terms of the judgment and maintain health insurance for the benefit of the children as required by a divorce? Well, Illinois has uh, a is a special plan called a qualified uh, child support order, which is a medical order that can be entered similar to a quadro, which requires the plan administrator of the health insurance policy for your spouse to withhold the payment of the premiums on that account to make sure that coverage is maintained for your children. 
this is an important area that you should address also with your uh, divorce attorney during the divorce process to make sure and to confirm that your spouse, if he has an obligation of the judgment to maintain health insurance for your children, that that premium gets paid. It's not uncommon in divorce cases after entry of the judgment for parties not to follow the terms of the judgment regarding maintaining and paying health insurance premiums. So this type of an order is very helpful and I strongly suggest that it be considered by many parties to a divorce to address those type of issues. In addition to these type of issues, there's also other uh, beneficiary uh, changes that need to be uh, addressed as it relates to other issues concerning your financial future. Powers of attorney for healthcare are documents that are prepared that specifically provide an agent on your behalf to, to uh, forward or make transition, transactions regarding your financial accounts and your financial interests in the event you become disabled or unable to make determinations for yourself. These are very helpful going forward in the event uh, there is a problem with your health and it will allow the agent certain uh, rights and obligations as it relates to making decisions regarding your financial issues. Uh, another issue uh, that it relates to as far as healthcare, there are, uh, the healthcare issue is making decisions as it relates to the uh, medical decisions for yourself. If you're unable to do so, you can appoint an agent on your behalf who can make those decisions and help you work, uh, help it make those decisions in the event uh, you're not able to do so for yourself. When you don't have a spouse that's there and you don't have any specific person who's been identified to make those decisions for you, it can create problems uh, regarding your health care and, and also uh, managing your financial assets after a divorce. So these are areas that should be addressed at the conclusion of your judgment for dissolution of marriage and the finalization of your divorce case to make sure that your future interests and which, what your wishes are are followed by your, uh, by your family and other individuals who are involved in your estate. So what's also critical to address is wills and trusts and other estate plans that are available that can be used to make your wishes known uh, as it relates to division of your assets post-divorce. These type of documents can be prepared by competent attorneys, specifically estate planning attorneys, regarding how to uh, change beneficiaries of wills, trusts, to make sure that your future wishes are followed. Uh, it's critical to review all wills that you may have prepared during your marriage to make sure that they are corrected to remove a spouse or other beneficiaries from those wills if that's your intention to do so. Same thing with trusts. So all of these issues are fairly complicated, but they can be easily addressed by meeting with an estate planning attorney and working hand in hand with your divorce attorney to address these type of issues. So in closing, it's imperative that once that divorce case is finalized, that you do address these issues that we've discussed this morning. Meet with an, an experienced estate planning attorney at the conclusion of your divorce or during your divorce to help address these issues. It will relieve a lot of anxiety and will also make your future financial situation more secure. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Uh, very informative. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next speaker, Emil Alcas. Emil is gonna talk about immigration issues arising in divorce. So, and again, if you have questions regarding any of these topics, please do not hesitate to uh, send that question via the chat platform. Uh, on this, and, and we'll tackle those questions at the end. So I thought, you know, Emil, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Thanks, Emil. All right, thanks, Ted. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so immigration and divorce, uh, not two things you really associate with each other. Um, so just briefly, so immigration law is more of a federal law than it is a state law. However, there is some interplay between the two. Now, with respect to divorce and immigration and, and you know those topics, well, what do we typically think of or what are some of the common issues that come up in a divorce case as it relates to immigration? So just to give you a little bit of background of immigration. Um, so in immigration, typically, uh, at least a family-based immigration petition, uh, a person will sponsor somebody, their spouse or a fiance to come over from overseas to live in the US or that person is here in the US already and marries a U.S. citizen. So then what happens? Um, 
just like anything else, they get married, they go through all the issues in a marriage, uh, all the ups and downs, and then ultimately some of these end in divorce. And what happens then? Because this person was sponsored, does that person automatically get deported? No, it doesn't work that way. So here's what typically happens. So when somebody petitions somebody for marriage, right, and says, hey, immigration, this is my spouse, I just married her, I want to make her a US citizen or get her permanent residency, which some people call a green card. So I want to get her a green card and ultimately make her into a US citizen. But during that process, you know, that process by itself can take several years. Um, you know, there's certain delays that occur with getting a green card. And then once you get a green card, you have to maintain that status for a number of years before you can petition to become a citizen. So there's about a five to seven years or so from getting your green card to getting citizenship based on marriage. And there's some instances where that's shorter, but for the most part, it's usually about five years until somebody can petition for U.S. citizenship. So what happens to that person, the person that's getting the immigration benefits, not, not the person sponsoring? So the U.S. citizen we're not so focused on because they're going to be fine. Nothing's going to be impacted from their perspective in terms of immigration or citizenship. The person that has the green card faces a dilemma. What do they do? You know, a lot of times what happens or commonly what happens is the person is brought over from overseas, typically doesn't have a lot of family here. Um, you know, maybe they'll have a few contacts or maybe a cousin, an extended family member that lives in the U.S., but not necessarily a family, you know, parents, siblings, things like that. And so that person doesn't have a lot of um, options. And so what would typically happen is if the, if the person who sponsors the immigrant wants to file for divorce, commonly what you'll see in, in I don't like seeing this, but a lot of times what you'll see is that person then wants to withdraw their petition. They want to re, you know, contact immigration and say basically, hey, I no longer want her to get any immigration benefits, so please cancel my sponsorship, et cetera, et cetera. And immigration can do that, so they can accept that letter and say, okay, fine, we're gonna stop the petition. If he asks us to stop it, it's his petition. He can dismiss it whenever he wants. He's dismissing it, it's over. But then the person that's wanting to get the immigration benefits faces a dilemma. What do they do? Do they just go back home? Or are there any other options? And so the person that has a green card, they already have the green card, but not US citizenship. Nothing will be affected from their immigration standpoint. Once they get the green card, they've pretty much established to immigration, at least, that this was a bona fide marriage, that this was a real marriage, and these are two people that sought these immigration benefits in good faith, right? And so that's what immigration looks at in terms of marriages is did this couple enter into this marriage legitimately or is it for fraud? So they, immigration has its own investigation that they do and, and conduct their own processes. And ultimately, they'll determine whether somebody's marriage is bona fide or real or, or not. And so if somebody has a green card, if somebody files, their spouse files a divorce against them, the green card holder doesn't have to worry about getting removed or deported or anything like that, or even lose their immigration benefits. They'll still maintain that green card. They no longer need that petitioning spouse. But let's get to the point where the person doesn't even have a green card. So they just submitted their paperwork to immigration and it's been six, seven months and they still haven't heard anything back from immigration as to whether they'll get approved or not. In those situations, if the person is has no immigration or uh, no status, as we call it in the US, right? So they don't have a green card, they don't have any work authorization, they basically have no documentation allowing them to legally stay in the US but for marrying a US citizen. So that person who is still in that sort of like pending or, or you know, the purgatory of immigration where you're just waiting to see what they say, it could take months or years sometimes to get that response. Those people are sort of left on their own. So if husband who is the US citizen applies for his wife who is not a US citizen, doesn't have a green card, and just arrived in the U.S., let's say, six months ago. So she has no status here, no legal status. So what happens to her? So she can still get immigration benefits 
even though the husband, the U.S. citizen husband files for divorce, so long as she can prove that, number one, that this was a legitimate marriage to begin with, and it just turned sour, and number two, she has to show some sort of abuse, whether it's physical or emotional or financial abuse, being perpetrated by the U.S. citizen husband. If she can prove those two steps, then she can be self-petitioning and get her immigration benefits um, from just on her own based on the issue of abuse. Um, so that, that's a little bit of some color with respect to people trying to get status in the U.S., but then while they're pending, while their applications are waiting to be completed to get full citizenship, what happens to those folks? Well, let's talk about the people that have petitioned somebody and that person has become a U.S. citizen, so all the immigration issues are resolved, right? And so now they're married, but ultimately end up in a divorce or legal separation. In a divorce case, there are financial documents that get exchanged between the parties. So the spouses of each side will exchange financial information about each other so that, number one, the court knows what the marital assets are. And number two, if one person wants support from the other, they can use those affidavits to get a better understanding of what the financial picture looks like for the other spouse. So in a divorce case, typically what you would exchange are what's called financial affidavits. And those are you know, standardized court forms that are exchanged in every divorce case. In immigration, there's something very similar to that. So when I, for example, petition my spouse to become a US citizen, I have to prove to the US government that I can financially support her. So I've got sufficient assets, sufficient income to be able to support this person while they're in the US so that that person does not go on, you know, public benefits or seek anything of that of those any of those resources. So the government's really particular about that. And so as part of the immigration process, I have to submit financial affidavits, very similar to a divorce case where I list all of my assets all of my income, and then you list all of your expenses. And then ultimately immigration will review that affidavit and determine whether you can financially support this person or not. So in a divorce case, if I were to get divorced from my spouse, who is now a US citizen, she in a divorce case can pull up my old financial records and establish to the divorce judge, hey, this person, several years ago, filed this financial affidavit listing all of this as his income and all these assets. But when we look at the divorce financial affidavit, we don't see a lot of these assets or, or maybe some of these assets aren't listed. So you can use other documents from the immigration process in divorce court to impeach somebody's credibility or to challenge somebody's financial affidavits or any discovery that they seek to produce as evidence in the case. So, um, so that is a concern. So does a divorce affect my green card? Um, it does not. So if, I've, if I am the person that has a green card and I married my spouse who, a US citizen, who is a US citizen, if he or she and I get divorced, what happens to my status? Uh, nothing. So again, so to get a green card, you have to establish to immigration, to the US government, that this was a bona fide marriage to begin with. And so presumably I have established that already because I was awarded my green card. And so that green card then stays with me. So there, there's no more reliance on my partner or spouse to be able to you know, keep taking the next steps to get my full citizenship. Once I have a green card, it's mine personally. It's like getting a diploma from a university. In a divorce case, you don't divide that. That's personal to that one person who received that degree or you know, diploma or whatever it is. And, and similarly in immigration law, um, that applies in both ways. So, you know, we don't typically get a lot of um, immigration issues in divorce, but these little issues do come up. And, and some of the common ones I see in my practice, I do a lot of divorce work and a lot of immigration work, is this issue that's on the screen now is, you know, a lot of people presume that this person, so for example, I am the US citizen, I petitioned my spouse who was not a US citizen. She's the one that files divorce against me. So the, the, the person that is seeking immigration benefits is the person filing divorce against the US citizen spouse. So what do I do um, if I 
presume that this was all based on fraud. Now, it's an extreme example, but there are cases where this happens. And so if you are the US citizen and you have sufficient proof, it can't be just on suspicion, it has to be actual proof of sorts. So there's a big burden placed on you to be able to prove that the marriage that you entered into with this person was based on fraud. Um, and what do you do if you do have that sufficient evidence? Um, all you do basically is contact the immigration office that provided those benefits. You would meet with one of their officers and provide the, the documentation or, or proof that you have that there was a fraudulent marriage. And then and that is your obligation. And then if you wanted to go to court and allege misdeeds in the divorce court, you know, you want to inform the judge that this person committed immigration fraud, divorce judges don't care anymore. So Illinois is a no fault state. So regardless if this person was a complete jerk and beat me up every day, uh, the reason why I'm getting divorced does not matter. So from the divorce perspective, the, the marriage, that being a fraud is not such a big concern. It is a concern with the divorce court, but it's not as big as it is with immigration because immigration is basically you're getting these benefits because you claimed you were married. And if it turns out that it was a fraudulent marriage, there are significant consequences that could result from that. So just to wrap up, you know, immigration issues are, are not that common in divorce. And, and we, I thought this was a, a good topic for this discussion here is because there are some of these issues and there is some interplay. So just be mindful that in a divorce proceeding, any documents or evidence that you provided in the immigration case, especially financial records, those could be used in a divorce proceeding to impeach someone's credibility. Um, so if anybody has any questions, uh, I can put my email address in the chat here. But the phone number is 847-705-7555. Feel free to reach out and we can schedule time to discuss more. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Emil. Thanks for that presentation. Very informative. Um, you know, again, I want to invite any uh, uh, members who are viewing. If you have a question, please put that in the chat uh, platform and we will tackle those questions after all of the uh, uh, panelists have given their presentation at the end. Uh, at this point, we're going to turn it over to Patty Levinson. Patty's going to talk about collaborative divorces. Collaborative divorces are getting more and more popular these days a, um, and for many reasons. And Patty's going to share us the benefits, the pros and cons of collaborative divorce. So, Patty, go ahead. Thanks, Ted. Um, good morning. A collaborative divorce is probably one of the best kept secrets in the area of domestic relations. But what is it? It's a process by which the parties can reach a settlement by agreement with the assistance of collaboratively trained attorneys. Can you go to the next slide, Ted? I think I'm a little ahead of myself. Um, in this process, the parties who are the ones who created their family are also the ones who determine what their family is going to look like after the divorce. Um, in this process, cooperation replaces adversarial approach. The parties are working as a team to get a mutually acceptable resolution. And that requires them to actively participate in negotiations in good faith. That means there's no games, gamesmanship. There's no playing hide the ball. There's no trying to get a, you know, advantage over the other side that will make you appear in a better light. It's all done in good faith. It's all done openly and transparently. And litigation is basically off the table. The parties agree at the outset of a collaborative divorce that they will not take their issues to a judge. Um, and nothing is filed until the collaborative agreements are reached, they're signed, and it's time to file the petition for dissolution of marriage and then get the parties divorced 
very shortly thereafter. Um, it's based on an interdisciplinary team approach. We put together what's called a collaborative team and we focus on the interests and goals of the parties rather than their wants. We focus on needs versus wants. A good example of this is when somebody will say, I need to stay in the house. I need to keep the house. Well, why do you need to keep the house? Because I want my children to stay in their same schools. Okay, so we drilled down. We had started with a need. We discovered the want. The want is to keep the children in the same schools. There are other ways that that might be accomplished than having that party stay in the house or um, keep the house. So what we try to do is get past the needs and focus, excuse me, get past the wants and focus on the needs. What do they need? Um, and we're looking to achieve the best results for all parties. Um, the collaborative team is made up of obviously the two parties going through the divorce and each party will have a collaboratively trained attorney. And that attorney represents the individual client while maintaining goals of the collaborative process. The attorney client confidentiality remains but there is permission to share more in a collaborative setting than you would have in a normal adversarial litigation case. Um, the attorneys educate and counsel the clients about legal issues and settlement options. Um, we discuss what might happen if the judge made the decision. Um, what does the statute have to say about this? We give the client information so they can make the decisions. And this whole process is client driven. The idea is that the clients here, both parties to the divorce, are the ones that are creating their divorce with the assistance of the collaborative professionals. The lawyers work with rather than against each other. Um, this is a difficult concept for some lawyers to deal with because traditionally lawyers are, are adversarial to the lawyers on the other side. In this case, that is not so. The lawyers are working together to get a resolution that meets the needs of both parties. Um, the lawyers help their clients articulate their interests and reach agreements that meet their needs. And at the end of the process, the lawyers prepare the legal documents necessary to fi finalize the divorce. If one of the parties decides this process isn't for them or they want to take an issue to the court, both collaborative attorneys must withdraw their representation of their client and the clients would have to get new attorneys if they wanted to pursue litigation. Um, in a collaborative process, the attorneys learn things about the other side that they would probably never know in a litigated case. And it puts the opposing party at a disadvantage to have that attorney represent their spouse in a litigated case after having learned what they've learned in the collaborative process. Ted? Um, there can be other professionals added to the collaborative team to achieve the best result for all. One would, could be a financial neutral. Now these, these professionals are not required. Two attorneys are required. And as the need arises in a particular case, we determine whether it would be best to introduce another professional or professionals onto the team. So we could add a financial neutral. 
And a financial neutral is usually a certified financial planner or analyst or a certified divorced financial planner or, or analyst that does go through the collaborative training process and they help educate the parties about the financial consequences of settlement options that are being discussed. They, they're also very useful when one party has more knowledge about the couple's finances than does the other. Um, sometimes one, one spouse has always handled the finances during the marriage and the other spouse is less knowledgeable. A financial neutral can help bring that less knowledgeable party up to speed, so to say, so that they can make an informed decision on financial issues related to their case. And by having the ability to learn about the tax implications, what their finances might look like after the divorce, um, what kind of projections the financial neutral might make about what it will look like for them at the time of their retirement. All these things can help facilitate the decision-making process. Another professional that could be added to the team would be a, a coach. Um, a coach is usually a mental health professional but they don't act in the role of a counselor or a therapist. They have also gone through the collaborative training and they help keep the process running smoothly and amicably if the parties are not quite able to comport themselves in that manner. Very often people will say, oh, we can do this, we can discuss it, we can reach agreements, but once they get into the collaborative setting and sit down at the table, they're bickering, they're bringing up issues about who didn't take out the garbage or who forgot to pick up the child from softball practice or any one of a number of things. And a coach can help get the parties back on track to focus on the issues that, are, that need to be addressed. Um, the coach can promote healthy communication skills and help lower the anxiety in the room. Um, the coach can also help the parties identify concerns that are underlying some of these disputes. Um, they raise issues time and again, and the coach can help the parties figure out what's at the bottom. It's not really about forgetting to pick up the child at softball practice. There is an underlying issue and the coach can help the parties identify that. And the coach can also help develop co-parenting skills between for each of the parties and develop a parenting plan for the family. Also, another professional that can be added to the team. And this is probably the one that is seen the least often is a child specialist. Um, that would also be a mental health professional who has gone through the collaborative training process. Um, and it is used when there are contentious issues related to the children. And this child specialist would meet with the children and ser serve as an independent and neutral, neutral representative of the children's needs. The child specialist gives the children a voice in the process. The children don't have a say in the divorce, but how the divorce is affecting the children can be brought to bear by a child specialist. The process works through a series of team meetings. There is an open and transparent exchange of information. When somebody requests documents, both parties agree that whatever is requested will be produced. 
Um, we eliminate the need for formal discovery and we work to tailor solutions to meet the needs of a family. All divorces are not the same. And sometimes when you go to court, judges may treat all divorces as being almost the same. But families are different. Individual family members' needs are different. The needs of the children are different. And a collaborative divorce is a way to almost think outside the box and tailor solutions to meet the needs of this specific family. They sit around the table brainstorming possible solutions. Um, different ideas get thrown out, discussed, accepted, or discarded um, until mutually acceptable solutions are arrived at and they take hold. That, that's, that's what wins. Um, in order for a collaborative divorce to, to be successful, there must be a paradigm shift by the attorneys and to a certain extent by the clients. People anticipate that a divorce is going to be adversarial. Lawyers typically in the past would go into court ready for battle. It's an adversarial situation with someone winning and someone losing. Um, the, the shift has to be from that adversarial situation to a cooperative team-like approach to a problem. Um, we're, we're trying to take the emotions out of it and look at it as more of a, a business transaction that is going to meet the personal needs of the specific people involved. We don't focus on the past and what was done in the past. Um, we're not gonna hear about why dad forgot to pick up Joni from her softball game, but we're going to talk about the future. How are we going to make sure that Joni gets picked up from her softball game on time every time she has a game or a practice? And we figure out solutions to that problem rather than berating the parent who failed to pick her up that one time. What we're looking to do is create a win-win situation for both parties. They make the decisions. They can say, okay, well, I really want to be able to have special time with the children on a regular basis. And we can figure out a way for that to, to work. The result is that the family is restructured. It's not broken apart. The family is, is just really rearranging. Do, everybody says a divorce splits up the family. It breaks the family. It doesn't have to. When there are children involved, these people will be in each other's lives for the rest of their lives. And the idea is to make the divorce happen in such a way so that it doesn't worsen the relationship of the parties, but rather allows them to redefine their relationships. The, when parties make their own decisions in a divorce, they can own them and it's easier for, for them to move on afterwards. Um, active participation in the decision-making results, excuse me, active participation in decision-making results in better relationships after the divorce. And a happy divorced family 
is still a happy family. Thank you, Patty. Okay, so at this time, I'm going to see if anybody uh, who's viewing out there have any questions. We do have a few questions already. So uh, this first question is directed to Joe, uh, and this deals in the area of a health insurance premiums. You know, and, and it's you know, and as far as payment of those premiums, can the parties to, to the divorce set up some sort of escrow account to kind of insure and, and make sure that both parties are going to make their contributions for the health insurance premiums for the for the children moving forward? Do you, do you ever see an escrow account used in that fashion? Yes, it is possible. The parties can pretty much agree to whatever they'd like to do as part of their settlement agreement as it relates to issues for the children or payment of expenses, including premiums and health insurance, health insurance out-of-pocket expenses. So it's not uncommon to see that type of language uh, in an agreement. The escrow account, however, has to be agreed upon by both parties. Uh, in, in certain situations where there's special circumstances, a court can also get involved in that area and also help establish something to that effect if necessary. Okay, thanks, Joe. Uh, next question for Emil. Uh, I mean, what are the, what, what's the consequences to parties that they're involved with a fraudulent, you know, marriage petition? Uh, you know, you're talking about earlier about if one party, uh, you know, if, if, the, uh, if the party receiving the green card starts a divorce and the other party wants to do something about it and claim that there was fraud, is that party exposed to potential consequences for participating in that fraud? Well, uh, no. So that party would be an innocent spouse, so to speak, right? So that person wasn't aware. I mean, obviously, if both were in a conspiracy to commit marriage fraud, then yes, there, there would be some uh, civil and criminal penalties associated with that person, the U.S. citizen. The person that doesn't have citizenship, most likely what happens is they get wrapped up in removal proceedings, which is what people commonly call deportation proceedings, right? And so that person wouldn't be serving prison time, so to speak, in the, in the U.S. They would be more uh, in the immigration court arena and the ultimate resolution that the immigration mm -hmm. attorney would want to do is get that person removed. So, um, and then for the person, the U.S. citizen who is wrapped up innocently, there, there are no consequences to that person. Um, so long as they can prove that this was a bona fide marriage in their eyes, uh, that this was a real marriage. But if they are found to have conspired with this uh, the immigrant that's seeking to get benefits, then yes, they could find you know they could be fined civilly, but also I think there, there's some more severe criminal consequences. Thank you, Emil. Uh, next question. This is for Patty, and this is dealing with a collaborative divorce setting. Uh, can parties who are seeking a collaborative divorce use two attorneys both from Lavelle Law? Are, are they required to have attorneys from different firms or in a collaborative divorce setting? Can they use attorneys from the same firm? Um, no, they can't use attorneys from the same firm. Eventually, what's going to happen is a, a case will have to be filed with the court. And it would appear as if one one firm was representing both parties and that cannot happen. So we can't, unfortunately, can't have two collaborative attorneys in Lavelle, at Lavelle, representing two parties to a marriage. Um, it, it would be great if that could be done. And I don't know that, you know, going forward, something, some exception might be able to be carved out for this. I, I, I would doubt it. Um, I, mean, just, I get the follow up, Patty. I mean, both parties need to be in agreement to do a collaborative divorce. You know, you can't have one party seeking a collaborative divorce and the other party's against it. I mean, it's not no, going to work. No, it, I, both parties have to be on board and they have to sign on and they have to basically give up the ability to litigate the case um, if they're going to follow through with the collaborative. But both parties have to be on board. Um, for a collaborative process to work. Okay, okay. And, and so collaborative divorce is not necessarily appropriate for everybody. It, it has to have a right situation. Right, there does, certain, certain cases are, 
I don't want to say always, but for the most part, not as appropriate for collaborative as, as others might be. And that would be some cases that were involving domestic violence um, or abusive situations, or sometimes if there's some criminal activity going on. Um, it works best when people are able to communicate and sometimes the communication breaks down between the parties so badly that a collaborative divorce cannot be accomplished. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Patty. Another question for Joe. Um, in that post-divorce situation where you're supposed to be, as you talked about, taking action in order to execute and implement the, the court order and division of assets, what happens if one of the spouses just doesn't cooperate, like they're bitter, they're angry, they don't want to sign the necessary forms in order to effectuate the court order. What, what can you do against a non-cooperating ex-spouse? In many of those situations, you can file what's known as a petition for indirect civil contempt of court with the court uh, to obtain an order requiring that spouse to comply. Many marital settlement agreements and judgments include provisions, however, that if a par par uh, sex spouse is non-cooperative, and unwilling to sign those documents, that in some cases the court can execute those documents on behalf of the parties. So that provision is, is fairly standard in most agreements, and it also gives the court the power to execute those if necessary, in addition to holding that spouse personally responsible uh, for that obligation. And a finding of contempt against the party for non-compliance could include a, a jail sentence for up to six months if that party refuses to comply. So there are provisions to allow enforcement uh, the terms of a judgment as it relates to the transfer of those assets. And then also uh, in that situation, the petitioning spouse for, you know, trying to seek a contempt order, they would, would they would be able to recover their attorney fees in that situation? Absolutely. The statutes provide that in the event someone is not properly acting or not acting reasonably or violates the terms of the, an agreement, mandatory uh, attorney's fees are awarded in those type of cases in the finding of contempt. Okay, thanks. Patty, question for you. Uh, I guess a follow-up to the question about trying to use two attorneys of Lavelle Law. How does, uh, you know, how, how does an individual find another collaborative divorce? I mean, this is kind of a unique area. Another collaborative divorce attorney, I should say. Uh, you know, you, you do that sort of work. Are, is there other collaborative divorce attorneys that you know that you can refer them to? Or is there a way to find another divorce attorney who would be willing to do a collaborative divorce? Both. Um, I know a number of collaborative divorce attorneys. I would be happy to pass along names. But many of, of the collaborative divorce attorneys in Illinois are members of a group called Collaborative Divorce Illinois. It's called CDI. Um, and I don't know their web address offhand. But if you Google Collaborative Divorce Illinois, there will be a listing of all the attorneys that are members of the group, all the um, financial neutrals that are members, the coaches, the child specialists, and you can find the list of attorneys there. That's not to say there are not other collaboratively trained attorneys, but this is probably the most um, direct way to find someone other than, you know, a referral from another collaborative attorney. Yeah, I think a referral from you, Patty, would be, uh, would be, would be a good idea simply because you've worked with these attorneys you're going to refer to in the past, and you probably know that they are a good attorney, they work well. That would be my suggestion, but yeah. I mean, That's very true, Ted, and if I could just add one more thing, it's important that the two attorneys work well with each other. So it's always better that the attorneys get have a good relationship because it makes the process much more smooth. Yep, yep. Emil, we have a question for you. Um, in a situation, uh, what happens if the, uh, in, in a marriage, a spouse who received their green card, what happens if that spouse is a victim of abuse? You know, does that spouse have somewhere to turn to try to, to, to seek you know, remedies in a situation when they're in an abusive household? Um, so they would be able to seek services just like anybody else. So, you know, 911, you can, do, you know, contact the police is obviously the first step. But then there are also remedies where they can get what's called an order of protection. 
which what most people think of as a they most people call it a restraining order, but it, it's technically an order of protection, which protects that individual from their spouse, um, you know, just like anybody else. So, you know, because somebody doesn't have U.S. citizenship, they, they're not afforded fewer rights than anybody else. So it, just like anything else, you know, it, how you would counsel your friend, you know, contact the police, get an attorney, go to court, get an order of protection. Those are the same steps that a person that doesn't have U.S. citizenship benefits would also be have access to as well. Another question. This is for all the panelists, and I don't know um, if you have any data or statistics. You know what? What? What percentage of marriages these days are ending in divorce? I mean, is it is a trend increasing? Is it going lower? What, what? What data do you guys see out there? I know there is some data indicating that it's still approximately fifty percent, but what we're also seeing more commonly now is parties that are not getting married. So what ends up happening is we get a number of parentage cases where children are born, parties do not stay together, and it creates all types of different legal issues that need to be addressed separate and apart from divorce cases. So as it relates to the percentages, I think it's still pretty close to 50%, uh, the last information that I've received, but I've, I've seen more common that more and more parties are not getting married, and we're dealing with issues that relate to child, child support, parenting time, custody, things of that nature, which are much more common. Yeah, Neil, Patty, you have anything to add to that question? Uh, I don't. Yes. No. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Patty, go ahead. No, I was going to say I don't. So if you do, please do. <laughs> it looks like we may have lost a meal. Um, all right, well, and I guess that's good timing because we're at the end of our time. And I wanna thank our panelists again, Patty, Joe, and Emil. Thank you for sharing those perspectives on those topics. Uh, as I said at the very beginning, uh, if you wanna, you know, if you have specific questions related to your scenario, I would encourage you to reach out to any of our panelists or myself. You can see their email addresses right there, uh, or you call us the main number. We'd always be willing to provide a free initial consultation to new clients relating to whatever topic they need to deal with. Uh, hopefully, this you found this informative. In addition, we're gonna this is gonna be shared and and recorded, and and uh, so you'd be able to access in the future. So, thanks thanks again for joining us uh, for another breakfast briefs. And we will be having another one uh, later on in the year. Uh, so that information will be circulated. Eventually we'll try to get to having these in, in person. You know, we, before the pandemic, we held these in uh, events in person. There was always a good opportunity to get together beforehand for some networking. And uh, we expect to do that in the near future. So keep your eyes open for that again. So again, thank you for joining us. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, that's another breakfast brief. Thank you again.